Hello, I'm Simon Benjamin and this is the second of my lectures on Fourier series, Fourier transforms, a little bit of that, and uh, PDEs, partial differential equations. Um, so in this lecture we'll build on what we found out last time, which was essentially what it, what is a Fourier series, what's the idea. We'll uh, extend it first to uh, understand how to deal with a Fourier series when we have a function with some period p um, instead of 2 pi. So we sort of said previously we just make it 2 pi for simplicity, but in the real world things don't have a periodicity of 2 pi necessarily, so we need that little extension. Then we'll talk about the, simpl the simplification that comes if we're trying to do a Fourier series um, of an even or an odd function. And then it's on to examples, which is maybe the, the exciting bit, because uh, that's where we'll find out if all the maths we've been working out actually works. Um, so we'll look at square and uh, square wave and triangular wave as examples. And the triangular wave is the one where in the last lecture I just typed in some numbers that I knew would work to Mathematica and we saw that um, a simple cos series started to take on that triangular form. But where were those numbers coming from? Well, this, this lecture we find out. So I'm going to start by writing out the uh, equations uh, that we came up with last time and uh, just to remind, uh, just as a reminder of what they look like, and then we'll extend them to work for any periodicity. So here I've written it all out to because just I'm a bit slow at writing things, so this is quicker. So given a, a period two pi function, uh, which we can of course write uh, as f of x plus two pi is equal to f of x, and here I've just scribbled some random crazy looking thing. And, but it is periodic because I just copy-pasted the script I'd written. Um, so you can see that from here to, let's say, here, the uh, x equals 0 line, and out to here, we've got a repeating uh, function. So what we would be saying is that this, um, this is 2 pi here. Someone has given us this function. doesn't have to look crazy, but it could. <laughs> then if we can write that thing, we can build it using a sum of cosines and sines, then those must be the coefficients. And that includes uh, the coefficient for a zero, because when we put zero into our cos nx, we make n is equal to zero, then that just becomes one. And uh, that also works, and that was why we uh, cheekily put this little factor of two in our definition, so that we would be able to so compactly write out our constants and not have a separate line just for a zero. Uh, at the uh, in the last lecture, I believe we ended up using subscript m here, here, and and therefore of course over here. But that again is just a, a dummy variable in the sense that n is you know some integer and it just appears on both sides. We'd used m because as part of the derivation we were using both n and m, and then it was important to tell the difference. But once we've got to our final line of definition doesn't matter what symbol we use and you know when you have a, 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 a line where you just need a single um, integer that can take any integer value it's conventional to use n so I've re reverted to just using n here hope that's not confusing anyway that that was pretty neat but of course we haven't actually proved that it works in that we, all of this has been based on if if it's possible to write our interesting periodic function in this way, then these are the coefficients. But it, maybe it isn't possible. <laughs> and so that's a topic that we will at least learn more about in this lecture because we're actually going to try it for some particular, particular interesting periodic functions. But the question of whether it will always be true or are there periodic functions that we could write down that won't work, uh, we'll, we'll say more about that, I think, in the next lecture. Anyway, there we are. So the first job that we have today is to extend this because I might have a problem in the real world that has a dimension to it like length and it has some periodicity to it. Maybe, and this is something we might look at, I have a stack of two different kinds of metal and uh, then and their sheets and then the z direction can be thought of as a periodic function because let's say the concentration of metal 1 goes from 100% to 0 to 100% to 0 to 100% to 0 um, in the z direction, but it will have some periodicity, which is the thickness 
of a sheet and not two pi. Um, so we need to understand how to convert a problem which has some general period into essentially a two pi case or in a, equivalently to just write down the equivalent of these equations but for a general period p. Now we don't really we can do this without really thinking very much about um, Fourier series specifically. All we need to do is to think if someone gave me a periodic function with period p, how would I convert that into a periodic function with period 2 pi? Then I solve my problem using my nice elegant equations here, and then I convert it back again. That might be quite a nice way to work because then I would never have to keep dragging around the details of the period of the function through the mathematical analysis. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, what we want is, well, someone has given us a function uh, which has some general period, and we'll call that period, actually we're going to use the symbol not P but capital L, just to be consistent with my notes. And remember that the notes are always available here at simonb.info if you're finding trouble uh, getting hold of them elsewhere. So we've been given some function G with the property that if you add L to it, um, you get back the same value again. Now, we don't want that. We want a function f. So we'll define a function f like this. We'll define a new function f, and it's equal to g, except now I'm going to scale what I feed into g. So let's write it like this with a gamma symbol. And we ask ourselves, what should this scale factor be? Now, I want it to be the case that f as period 2 pi. So as I change x from um, 0 to 2 pi, I want this scaled thing that I'm feeding into the g function, which is gamma x, to go from 0 to p. Oh, sorry, l. We're using capital L as our symbol. So what does that mean? It means that our gamma must be equal to uh, just the factor that will make this happen from these two lines. So we're going to times, it will be L, excuse me, over 2 pi. Um, so we can get rid of that question mark. And um, I hope you can see that if, if gamma has this value, then it will perform that rescaling for us. And we can quickly confirm that works, but just to sort of make our definition explicit. So what we're saying now is that, at, yeah, I'm defining a new function uh, f of x as being l over g of l over 2 pi x. Fair enough. So now, um, what is f of x plus 2 pi going to be? So it takes a little bit longer to sort of write it out, um, even than it does to say it. But by choosing this um, factor by which we uh, stretch or compress uh, the variable x, we're able to have a new function that has the periodicity that we want. So having tied it up, we have this, but and of course we can, uh, it may be helpful to sort of uh, translate one way or the other. So the other way to write this is that um, if we were focusing on what uh, we would rewrite g of x as, well, we would say g of x is equal to f of x, and then we just need to reverse this factor to translate back the other way. So that's how we would uh, translate from g into a function that we uh, might find more convenient to work with, and then at the end, translate back again. So using that principle, if we come to the uh, line above and rewrite explicitly, we don't need to remember our defining equations in terms of the general period, because all we need to do is remember this conversion trick. But still, just for the sake of it, let's write out now what we uh, will get if we if we choose to write the gen the fully general version of the Fourier series. So now the Fourier series for some function g, which has period capital L, is going to be defined like this. g of x is equal to again we have our constants. Oh dear, there we go. Plus the sum from n equals one to infinity of a n cos. Now this is where we need to watch it. Because of the way we've defined the relationship between g of x and f of x, if we're, look, if we're working from uh, this line up here, which was giving us 
the expression for f, f being periodic with 2 pi, then we now need to do the substitution and uh, to put in 2 pi over L uh, as an additional factor. So we're going to get cos n times 2 pi over L times x. And then we'll have our bn sine term. But again, the sine will pick up this same factor, 2 pi over L x. So that's OK. Um, it's uh, just a bit more sort of complex looking than our nice elegant expression for f, but that's all right, we can, we can do it. And now what we'd like to do is to convert our expressions for these unknown constants, or rather for <laughs> the values of the constants that at the beginning of the last lecture were unknown, but we pinned them down. Uh, we need to convert those expressions if we are going to write things in the natural way for uh, our period L function called g. So we need to take the lines above and just substitute. So we know that a subscript n, for example, is cos nx times f of x. But now we need to substitute what is f of x. It is g of um, l over 2 pi x dx. Now, um, because x is in any case just a dummy variable here, for clarity, let's uh, uh, do change of variables. And we'll change to a new variable u, which is equal to l over 2 pi x, or in other words, x is equal to 2 pi over l u. Those are obviously the same. Oops, those are obviously the same statement. Um, so let's see what happens when we do that conversion. We'll get 1 over 2 pi. Now, when the old integral goes from 0 to 2 pi, then in terms of u, we'll be going from 0 to l. So we can write cos nx, and we substitute, of course, so that is cos of n 2 pi over L uh, times uh, u. And g, however, now just becomes g of u. And we have uh, dx. We're going to pick up this factor, 2 pi over L du. And neatening that up, what we are going to get, unsurprisingly, is something that's very similar to the original expression. But now all the 2 pi's have turned into L's. Well, they would if I would write it neatly. And let's see how we can write this cos. We could write it as 2 pi n over L, I suppose, u, du. So that's our uh, expression for a n. And our expression for b n would convert in exactly the same way. Now, because this variable u is just a dummy variable, we can use absolutely any symbol for it we like, of course. Um, we could now write that line with x. Um, just a dummy variable and forgetting you know, that we uh, previously introduced two symbols because we needed to explicitly change a variable to keep track of what's going on. Now we've got the final line, we can use any symbol we like. And so we wouldn't use u because that just looks a bit unusual to the eye. We go back to using x in our sort of summary definition. So let's do that now. Uh, we we'll, can't fit it all on one screen, so we'll need to copy down our statement about the Fourier series in terms of gx. We'll put that at the top of a new page. And uh, straighten it out a bit, perhaps. There we go. And uh, we'll say then that uh, working in terms of this g of x thing, we can say that the constants a n are equal to 1 over l, the integral from 0 to l of cos of 2 pi n over l times x. As I warned you, I'm just choosing now, just to, so that it looks nice and conventional, I'm just using w, dummy variable x. And bn is, of course, going to be the analogous thing, but in terms of the sine. So those would be the equivalent sets. Uh, in fact, if you want to just memorize one thing, oops, that didn't go. There we go. If you want to memorize just one thing, then that would be the one to memorize because uh, it gives you the completely general case. But I wouldn't memorize that. I would memorize this version, which I find to be uh, much more pleasing, the one I'm about to highlight in pink here. 
because these ones I understand uh, where they came from they just have these the most simple form they can have just do it like that <laughs> um, and then I would just remember or, or rederive it was pretty easy that if we want to scale a function we need to use uh, this line here but really it doesn't matter which set of expressions we use they uh, they do the job and uh, by the way we can verify here that if we do put in l is equal to 2 pi we just get back the original expression as we must because this orange highlighted set is completely general it doesn't say it's not 2 pi it just says that it has period l okay let's move on to a quick and uh, pretty uh, e easy topic a helpful one which is what if the function we've been told to analyze and create a Fourier series for happens to be an even function or what if it happens to be an odd function that should help us we would expect because we've already defined or uh, derived the expressions which work in general so if we're now adding in a special constraint then if anything that should make those expressions simplify and it will now uh, so let's write it out um, I'll switch over to a different color let's do uh, black for a change so um, we need to figure out what are these constants a n and b n in the case that our function is even or odd let's take the case that f of x is odd first let's say then uh, what 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 are the helpful implications for us the answer comes from uh, looking at our expressions and changing them so that they do go from minus pi to pi rather than from 0 to 2 pi now you remember in the last lecture the, the way we got these expressions was just by integrating over one complete cycle it wasn't important that it was 0 to 2 pi it could have been from any point k to k plus 2 pi right we, we can um, as long as we sweep out one complete cycle all the arguments in the last lecture would have worked now what do we say to consider first well first we're thinking about what if f of x is odd well then I want to ask what do we have for this um, product the cos times the f of x the complete integrand in this um, expression it's now going to be some kind of even function actually cos times some kind of odd function our function what do we get if we multiply together an even and odd that 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 function which is the product of those two things is it even is it odd is it neither well it's all about what happens when we change the sign of x right so if we change the sign of x inside cos it doesn't care cos of minus x is cos of x if we change the sign inside of our f of x it does care um, so what we're saying when we when we say that f of x is odd what we mean by that is that f of minus x is equal to minus f of x remember as we introduced in the last lecture so that means that uh, what will happen if we change the sign in that product is the whole thing will pick up a minus sign because of the f of x element and so the whole thing is odd so the product of an odd function and an even function itself is an odd function but we know that when we integrate an odd function between two symmetric limits either side of the origin it must be zero hooray and so we just don't need to do those integrals we could they'd come out at zero but why do an integral when you know it must be zero so uh, you're kind of just wasting your time and, and risking making a slip maybe you won't get zero but that's because you made a slip it must be zero and similarly for exactly the same so what we're saying is if f of x is odd the a n coefficients are all zero but the b n are not in general zero some of them might be zero but uh, that's that those are the ones that will be doing all the work if we have an odd function and remember the b n coefficients are the ones in our expression which uh, actually control the sign terms so really we're saying very something very intuitive which is that if our for if the function we're trying to build is odd we only need the odd building blocks that is the sign building blocks we don't need the even building blocks and remember that a constant is actually an even function so a0 over 2 here is also even so we're saying an odd function can be built purely out of the odd components 
all the even components should have um, coefficient zero. We won't, you know, we won't need them. And it won't surprise you to realize that exactly the same thing is going to be true if we reverse the question and say, what if, if uh, f of x is, uh, excuse me for writing a messy way, is uh, even, if f of x is even, then all the arguments that we've just made go through. We're now going to inspect the bn terms. We can, as we've proven, write that um, from minus pi to pi. It will be sine n x times f of x. But now f of x is even. But now that will be, because sine is odd, that's still odd times even. And same argument. It must be equal to 0. So if we have an even function f of x, we won't need any of the sine terms. Their coefficients must all come to 0. We'll just need potentially that a0 constant and the cos terms. So to say it one more time, an odd function is going to be entirely made out of a Fourier series of sine terms. An even function is going to be entirely made out of a, of a Fourier series of a constant and cosine terms. Great simplifies our work, right? It uh, reduces the amount of stuff that we need to do by perhaps a factor of uh, two in that we only have to do one of two different integrals. Now with all that said, it's clearly high time for us to do some examples and actually see if it all works. It's all been very provisional up to now. We've derived expressions for what these weights should be if it's possible to write it in that way at all. And we've gone on to say, oh, by the way, I can make it have period L if you want. And by the way, if the thing that I was given was even or odds, that will simplify my expressions down. But we still haven't seen it in action. So it's time to do that. Let's do that right now. And we'll start off with um, the one that will be the simplest to integrate. I mean, they're all the examples that I'm going to work through are pretty easy to integrate. But the simplest of all is going to be if we consider a square wave. The square wave goes from goes between 0 and plus 1, and it goes instantly from 0 to plus 1, and we said we want to have period 2 pi. How can we write, so that's a diagram of it, that's a sketch, how can we write it uh, as a, um, how can we define it mathematically as an expression? We would say f of x is equal to plus 1 if x is, let's say, uh, greater than or equal to 0, but less than uh, pi. And it's equal to 0 if x is oops, greater than pi, but less than 2 pi. And my pi symbols continue to be slightly off. Um, and, of course, we just impose its periodic function with our usual notation x plus 2 pi, f of x plus 2 pi is equal to f of x. That will do the trick in terms of defining our function mathematically. Now I've tried to be a bit careful here and not uh, accidentally define f of x to be both plus 1 and 0 at a particular point at these switchover points. So I made sure to say that it's plus 1 only up to but not including pi and then it becomes 0 from pi, um, but then up to but not including 2 pi, because we know 2 pi must be back and be the same as 0. So strictly speaking, we need that definition. Otherwise, we'll have accidentally defined a two-valued two function. Now we need to do the integral. But this is going to be a really nice integral to do, because the integrand is either 1 or 0. So let's, let's now also... <laughs> Having just talked about odd and even functions, we look at this thing. Is there a trick we can do? Because I don't want to have to do more work than I need to. This function is, annoyingly, not odd or even. It doesn't have the property that for um, some negative value of x, the function is just the same or the same up to a sign as the positive value of x. Um, so I could just go ahead and say, oh, well, tough, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't odd or even, but I, I'm lazier than that, and I like to spend a little bit of time thinking about a trick if the trick will save me 
having to look at two integrals and I only have to look at one of them. What could I do here to make this, to translate this function into an odd or even one? Or in other words, to solve a problem that is odd or even, and then in solving that problem, I'll easily see that I've solved this problem that I've been given. Well, how about if I just shift things a little bit? So let me be more careful. There we go. So if I move up like that, that uh, function now is an odd function. It goes between plus a half and minus a half, and it has all the properties that we require of an odd function. So actually, just to save a bit of time and to, um, you know, do the slightly uh, cheeky shortcut method, I will go ahead and uh, define a new function. So here we go. Copy, paste. All right. So I'm just erasing all the references to f and uh, changing them to h. And I'm also going to have to adjust the limits, of course, from to go uh, from plus to minus a half. So in other words, the relationship here, of course, is that my h is just equal to f of x minus a half. And I'll need to remember that to translate back at the end. <laughs> but now it's an odd function. Good. So because it's an odd function, all the arguments we just made, um, so I can write here h of x is an odd function. And that means that I will not have to work out any of the a um, terms. I only need to go and get my expression for bn. Let's copy it down and work it out. That should do it. Let's copy that. So this, this I do need to work out because a of n for all values of n is just 0 for free. So that was worth it. It was worth just shifting my function up to not even have to look at that integral. So it would have been easy to do anyway, but we don't have to look. Let's uh, see what we get now. So we're going to say um, 1 over pi. The integral from 0 to 2 pi, we'll just write it out, I guess, of sine and x. But now we have this uh, plus a half minus a half type of thing, right? So um, rather than trying to write that out all in words, what I should do is split up my integral into those two parts. So it's going to be a part which is from naught to pi, and there it is equal to uh, the f of x is equal to plus a half dx, and then um, from pi to two pi um, sine n x again, but now it's going to be minus a half dx. Okay. Fine, fine, fine. Um, it looks like it's. There, there looks to me like there may be some further simplifications to be had here, but I'm just going to uh, not do any more tricks and just evaluate one of these. Um, it, I'll just go ahead and evaluate it. So it's not very hard at this point, right? So I can see that um, I can take out a factor of a half here. So I can say, well, that's going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi. And then I'm just going to go ahead and just write these things out because it's just, after all, it's just, I'm just integrating sine, which is pretty easy. I can't make it much easier than that. So the integral of sine is minus cos. But because of that n factor in there, I also need to divide by n from 0 to pi. And then over here, I had a minus sign, um, which uh, came from the minus a half factor. Well, let's just do it. So, so the same thing. From uh, pi to 2 pi. Right? It doesn't seem that that should be too bad. I just have to think what those things are. So 1 over 2 pi. Hmm. 
So cos of 0 is 1. Uh, so that's easy. And cos of n pi. Now, what is cos of n pi? Well, let's just, I'll tell you what, let's just take it slow. So I can see that there's a factor, by the way, of 1 over n. n is just a constant as far as this um, integral is concerned. It can't be 0, by the way, because this is the bn coefficients we're working out, and there is no b0. So I'm perfectly safe to take out n in front. n must be at least 1, and it's just some integer. And now I can go ahead and write out what we're talking about. So minus 1 is uh, is one of the limits, but that's at the uh, minus. Okay, so let's, let's do it properly. Um, we've got minus cos of n pi. And then minus, uh, oh, sorry, let's put the whole thing in another set of brackets, perhaps, to make it very clear. So we've got minus cos of n pi minus 1, because the limit at x is equal to 0 is just 1. And then over here, we've got minus, uh, and there was a I missed off sign there, so that turns into a plus. And that is going to be cos of 2n, uh, 2 pi n, uh, minus cos of n pi. All right. We've got to close up a lot of brackets like that. Okay, but uh, it's an unusual sort of uh, expression, maybe, uh, compared to most integrals that you might have met in the past, but in fact it's a very simple one. All we need to do is to simplify it as much as possible and then replace our cos n terms with what we know, our cos n pi terms with what they know they must be. So I see that I've actually got um, if I note that this is the first one to pick on, cos of 2n pi, well, cos of 0 is plus 1, and when I add 2 pi, or any multiple of 2 pi, onto cos, I just, I don't change it. So it must always be plus 1. So that is just a 1. And I see that I have another one if I note the minus minus. So that's going to be 2, and then it's going to be minus 2 cos of n pi. Is that as neat as I can get it? No, I can keep going. Because what is cos of n pi? This is now interesting. Let's try and write out our cos uh, using my very limited sketching skills. Yeah, and they're off to a wonky start as usual. And I can, I can go in the negative direction a bit. So there's cos. Now let's mark on what we're talking about. So that's pi. That's 2 pi, that's not really room for it, but that's 3 pi, and so on. What can we see? At n is equal to 0, not that that's actually one of the n values we'll be considering, um, we would have uh, plus 1. At n equals 1, we have minus 1, then plus 1, then minus 1. So what we can see is that cos of n pi is equal to plus 1 if, it's, if n is even, and minus 1 if n is odd. But there is a neater way to write that. We can just write it as minus 1 to the power of n. Because then, again, if n is even, that's just going to give us plus 1. Right? Is that the smartest we can write it? So let's see where we're up to. We're writing this now as we can cancel out a couple of factors of 2. So that's 1 over n pi. And then this will become uh, 1 minus minus 1 to the power of n. Is that the neatest we can write it? Well, that is a pretty compact way of writing it, but what, what is 1 minus minus 1 to the power of n? Again, as we let n, um, so if, if we think about n is 1, 2, 3, and so on, then this quantity, 1 minus minus 1 to the power of n, is going to be equal to what? Well, um, it will be equal to 2, comma, so when n is equal to 1, that's 2, but when n is equal to 2, that's 1 minus 1, which is 0, and then it will be back to 2, and it will be 0, and so on. So in fact, what we've got is that our integral comes to either, um, let's uh, finish writing it out, just 2 over n pi, if n is odd, or um, 0, if n is even. And here I just, I don't mean odd or even function, of course, n is just an integer, so I simply mean if that integer is um, even. There we are, so we've now completed our integral, and we're ready to write out our Fourier series. 
because we found out that quite a lot of the terms are zero. Namely, all the an terms, they're just out zero. And uh, half of the bn terms are also zero, but the other half are not zero, and they're obviously going to be uh, doing all the work. So we can write our Fourier series. Our Fourier series was, if we remember, um, f of x was equal to um, an a0 term that we don't, oh, um, excuse me, this is h of x we built. h of x is equal to no a terms at all, including no constant, but just the b terms. And we only want to sum over the odd values of n. So I can just write odd n equals 1 to infinity. Um, so it's clear what I mean by that is just don't bother me with n is 2 or 4 or so on in my sum. And then I can just go right ahead and put this expression in 2 over n pi like I may have. We'll see what happens. 2 over n pi of um, sine of nx. So that's actually a pretty compact Fourier series. Uh, not bad. There's no reason not to take that uh, part of that uh, factor out in front. So we can write 2 over pi. We'll just bring that out in front of the sum symbol. And now, again, we'll write odd n from n equals 1 to infinity of just, let's write it like this, sine of nx over n. That's pretty neat. That's it. That's our whole Fourier series because so much of it just turned out to be zero. But let's just uh, just to completely finish the story, because otherwise it will be a bit unsatisfactory to, ha to, to miss off one line of it. f of x, of course, uh, if we go back, all of this that we've been solving cheekily is for the adjusted function to make it into an odd function. Um, but f of x, based on our definition here, f of x is equal to h plus a half. So we just need to add in that half factor. So if we say a half, and then write uh, the line above, we really will have finished it completely. The only other thing I might want to say before we switch over and, and have a look at this to see if it works is the following. Mm. Is there another way? If we do, What if we don't like writing our sum symbol with this sort of odd only rule just written in words? It's fine, actually, and, and you would find that in a scientific uh, publication. People write special constraints underneath the sum symbol just like that, because sometimes that's the most elegant way to do it. Um, however, if we don't want to, if we do want to run over all possible values of n, there's another trick we can do, which will just be uh, completely equivalent. So let me write it out. What we can do is we can run over absolutely all values of n, starting from, let's say, n is equal to 0 and going to infinity, if we um, take those values of n that are being generated by the sum rule and double them and add 1. That would be the, the trick here. Uh, and so where we had n in the line above, we'll now write 2n plus 1. And I think you can see that when n is equal to 0, 2n plus 1 will become 1, and so on. So these two things are completely equivalent, and it really is just a matter of taste as to which one you write down. They are, as it were, both full mark answers. But now it really is time to switch over to Mathematica. And by the way, in the notes, um, what we're about to do is shown in uh, lines of code that work in MATLAB, which is another alternative. And there are many other maths packages that are meaty enough to do this job, which is really rather a simple job. So here we are with Mathematica. Let's try out that. I honestly um, don't know. Uh, as I'm deriving it through, I, I wasn't checking. So um, we're, going, we're about to find out whether that uh, factor of 2 over pi, I think it is right, but we'll see. Uh, maybe I made a slip. We'll find out. So, um, so a half, that's definitely correct, plus 2 over pi, that's what we derived. And now the sum, Mathematica will occur will just perform a sum for us by when we type in sum of a bunch of sine functions. And we'll do that trick of doubling an integer and adding one to generate only the odd integers. And then we have to divide by exactly the same odd integer. Uh, and now we need to tell Mathematica over what range. We'll go n from, uh, I don't know, zero. We have to start from zero because that, when we do two n plus one, gives us the first element one. But we'll go up to five. and. Uh, so if we 
execute that, we get what we expect. Um, here is our sum of, for example, terms like sine 5x over 5. But we don't need to see that every time, so I'll put a semicolon in here so that it hides it. What we really want, so it's hiding it now, is to plot f. Let me make a bit of space so it's easier to read. We want to plot f uh, for some range of x. Let's go from, I don't know, minus 7 to 7. And we'll see if it looks about right or not. Now I'm, it looks interesting. Let me just scale it a bit so that it doesn't take up too much space on the screen. Now we're scaling it. Um, yeah, not bad, not bad. Um, it's not it's not there yet, but of course we're only doing five terms, not an infinite uh, series of terms. We can see it's trying to build that switching function for us. It has the period that we expected. We can see it there switching from uh, um, over the range of 0 to 2 pi, it spends half the time at 1 and half the time trying to be 0. What's not inevitable, so it's good to see it, is that it indeed builds the correct switching function that, you know, we could have uh, messed up the derivation and then it wouldn't be constructing it. Still, it's not there, it's not ideal, right? So we could ask what will happen if we increase the number of terms. And I want to paste it and we'll, have a, we'll actually have a second function where let's put two on the screen at once. So let's call them f and g, and f will be from 0 to 5, but g will be from 0 to 15, and we will just compare them to really see what we're dealing with here. Okay, and we could zoom in. Let's zoom in on uh, just a, a little bit negative, uh, negative 1, and a little bit outside the 2 pi range. Um, so let's indeed go to 7 like that. So yeah, mm. that's the effect of increasing the number of terms. Nice. How about if we uh, went to a more serious serious number? After all, Mathematica is powerful software, and it's running on a remote machine that's pretty powerful. Let's go to 100 terms. Boom, that was quick. <laughs> now, uh, it's getting really good. Um, there, you can see, we could even zoom in actually between, let's go, uh, so we see there in the big picture, it's getting very much like our switching function. But let's zoom in and see exactly what's happening uh, near the origin. So let's go from uh, 0 to uh, 0 0.2. Let's home right in. Interesting. So um, I remind you that from 0 onwards, it should ideally be exactly 1. The um, blue line that's made of only five terms is still working its way up at this stage. Doesn't uh, it? It is just about gets to gets still and goes above one by the 0 0.2 point. The um, orangey brown line, with its hugely larger number of terms, is uh, able to get um, get up there to the to the plus one region much more quickly. But there's an interesting effect which is still overshoots. And let me show you. I if I think if I go out just a little bit further to 0.3, we'll see something interesting. Now. The amount that it overshoots by is about just less than um, 0.1, right? It should be ideally stopping at 1, and it's overshooting to 1.1. And that's the same amount of overshoot that we got with the much cruder approximation. Now, it, it's still, I, for any practical purpose, it's much better to take the orange um, function here, the one with 100 terms, because it's, it's getting much closer to the ideal. But it's still kind of interesting that it overshoots just as much, albeit it almost immediately corrects back. What would happen if we tried five... Well, let's make something that will still be um, visible on this range. Let's go up to 300 terms and evaluate that. Okay, it's still overshooting by the same amount, but of course even more correct, um, quickly it corrects back. So in terms of uh, how important that defect would be if we were doing some numerical calculation. It's getting more and more trivial. And so it, you know, it's, it's a tiny and tinier error, but it always overshoots by the same amount. And that's actually been studied by mathematicians. And it has the name, the Gibbs phenomenon. The fact that it doesn't go away, it still overshoots, albeit that overshoot would be less and less of a problem for any practical purpose. Now, if we do zoom out uh, back to our, what were we doing, minus 7 to 7, 
and have a look at this extremely large series of 300 terms, well, we, we see those tiny spikes which Mathematica is plotting for us, um, but um, we see that it's, it's really getting extremely close now to the switching function we asked for. Let's just whack in a crazy number. I'll just add a zero on here. And that took Mathematica a tiny fraction of time to actually work out. But that overshoot is, let's, let's home in and see if the overshoot is still there. Let's go from naught to, uh, I don't know, 0.01. There it is. We're incredibly zoomed in now, um, but it's, it's still there. It's still making it nearly up to 1.1 before correcting back. Um, so uh, that, that is, you know, that's the answer. It works. Um, in the infinite limit, it would still shoot up to 1.1, but now with zero width, the width of that little overshoot would vanish, and we would, by any reasonable measure, say that we have converged to the function that we wanted. Now let's quickly go back, um, and we can go a bit faster this time, and work out the triangular wave as a quick second example, because for that one, uh, that was the very example that we started the first lecture with, and we said, oh look, uh, cos, uh, cos terms add up to something interesting. Let's now see if we can derive what the, what the expression that I was using when I just typed in uh, the, uh, the interesting example. So let's uh, switch back and finish that. What we need to do is draw a triangular wave. We, you know, we could draw uh, a bunch of things that are essentially versions of the triangular wave. It's up to us where um, how it aligns in terms of uh, what value it has at the origin and so on. But I will go for this one, which might be the easiest. Certainly, the first thing to think of. And uh, one of the reasons I'm drawing this is that this is obviously going to be an even function. And that's, as we found out, going to make it just a little bit easier to, not so much easier, just quicker to do the work. So um, I want my triangular function, by the way, to go from pi, um, because again, that's going to keep things nice and easy in terms of the constants, because I, can, I, can, I could have chosen plus one, it's going to go from some value, right, uh, to um, zero. The complete cycle is two pi, and so of course the point here is pi and minus pi and so on. So that's the function I now want to analyze. I know my Fourier series expressions, but I also know that because this is an even function, I, there's no point in even thinking about the sine terms. They must come to zero. So the bn are equal to zero for all values of n, and only the an need to even be talked about. And for them, it's the integral from naught to, well, over one complete cycle, is the way we like to say it, so it would be the uh, we can certainly integrate from naught to um, two pi if we want, but as we were discussing before, we can make that from minus pi to pi if we like, and in fact I do like to do that in this case. So uh, as is generally the case when we're trying to exploit the properties of even and odd functions to make our integrals as quick as possible. So now I would say that that is uh, the integral um, of cos n x times our function f of x. I suppose I should really not just define it by um, a diagram, but make a little bit of room and just think how would we write that mathematically. So there we are. That's the definition of our function. Let's get back down to what we were doing, which was actually working out these constants. How are they going to come out? Well, okay, so it's an even function times another even function. So this integral, in particular the, the integrand here, uh, is a product of two even functions. Cos is even, and we know our f of x is even. Two even functions, their product is also an even function, because neither of them care about the sign. When you feed uh, minus x in, they give you the same thing as if you fed in plus x, and so their product also has that property. So now it's the integral of an even function between symmetric limits, and because of the mirror-like property of even functions that we saw in the last lecture, that means that all we have to do, if we want, is to integrate, let's say, over the positive half of that range, ignore the negative half, and just times by 2, because the negative and positive integrals must be equal to each other. So we would do that trick to save a little bit of time. So what we just write down is that it's 2 uh, times the integral from 0 to pi of cos and x, and then we only need to take the function definition for that positive range, 
and that's the whole uh, job that we need to do. What have we got? Uh, well, we've got a good old uh, normal cos, so let's separate it at this point into two expressions. Cos of nx dx, mm -hmm. now I can see what that's going to do, which is to say it will come to nothing, but we'll work it out, minus 2 uh, integral x cos of nx dx. Well, that one looks like it might be the slightly tricky one. Let's do the first integral, and as promised, I think we'll find that this will come to zero. So let's get the 2 pi out in front. Integral of cos is sine nx divided by n between 0 and pi. Um, so that is 2 pi, uh, I'll take the n out, sine of n pi minus sine of 0, which is 0. But sine of n pi, what is that? n is an integer to remember. So uh, sine of pi, sine of 2 pi, sine of 3 pi, sine of 4, 4 pi, all of those are 0 because that's exactly the point where the sine function crosses the x-axis. So that whole thing is 0. So we only care about the second term. Let's uh, focus on that one. So we're saying that a of n is equal to uh, minus 2 times uh, this second integral, which we'll do this one here. We'll do that integration by parts. If you don't know what integration by parts is, then, uh, uh, well, that's an interesting thing to, to find a lecture on, but I, I guess I'm not trying to teach integrals here. But the trick is, it's a product of two functions. So we can do, uh, we can choose one of those functions and integrate it and the other one and differentiate it. And so we will integrate the cos to make it into sine. So that will become x times sine of nx over n between the limits. And then we need to subtract off a new integral that um, has the differentiated function x, which just goes to 1. And then also, of course, sine of nx dx. Now, uh, this first term is going to give us 0 um, for exactly the reason that we had above which is that um, when we have sine of n times pi, it will be zero. So that first term is going away. We are left with only the second term. And when we uh, cancel the signs, yep, I was worried about the sign uh, adding, because uh, I, I, I recall that the answer here should come out positive, but, a bit positive, but it will, because we have minus two, minus one over n, which gives us two over n. But when we integrate sine, uh, that gives us cos, but minus cos. And that's what I was failing to remember momentarily. And that is from 0 to pi. So what we end up with is uh, now going to be uh, 2 over n squared. And then uh, the 0 uh, is going to give us a cos of 0, which is 1. And then minus cos of n pi. But we already discussed that cos of n pi is actually minus 1 to the power of n. And so what we have here in the end is that the a n constant is going to be equal to 2 over n squared times 2, so actually 4 over n squared. That will be the case when n is um, odd, because then it will be, this term here will be 1 minus minus 1, which is 2. On the other hand, when n is even, it will be 1 minus 1, which is 0. So we need to write that it's 4 over n squared if n is odd, but it is 0 if n is even. And that is now, uh, we're now ready to write down our Fourier series using that rule. Except that um, we uh, need to be a little bit careful. There's a trick here. Our expression for a n that we've been working through faithfully here works for all values of n, including n is equal to zero. However, I, when I was rushing through this, uh, it was all legit until we needed to integrate the things that involved cos of nx, and we ended up dividing by n, which of course is not correct. If n is equal to zero, that would give us an infinity, and the reason that's gone wrong is that really for n is equal to 0, we should be writing cos of nx is just 
1. So we need to do that as a special case, but fortunately it's a super easy special case, so we can fit it in this little space at the top. For a0, we should be integrating, uh, in fact, we can still uh, use this line here, because that's before we try to integrate uh, cos of 0 x. <laughs> um, so that would be from 0 to pi of simply 1 times pi minus x dx. And uh, so that is the integral of just a constant, is the first term there, and then the integral of minus x. So we can simply do this. It's going to be um, just uh, pi squared, and then the minus x term is going to give us minus x squared. So let's just write that, that, that one we can write, I think. Uh, that's going to be minus x squared over 2 from uh, 0 to pi. But that will just give us minus pi squared over 2. So in fact, the result is pi squared over 2. So that is a little bit of a tricky fiddly element there. Almost a downside to the compact way that we're writing our a n coefficients so that the special one, the a n, where n is 0, which gives us the constant term in our Fourier series, is still within the same uh, prescription. But then we need to watch it that we're sometimes going to be integrating cos of nx, and n might be 0, in which case cos of nx isn't actually a function of x, it's just the number 1. So we need to splinter off that case and do it as a special case, um, and then, then, then we're fine. So a, n, a0 is equal to pi squared, so uh, let's, um, you know, we can add that down to our special cases here. In fact, just summarize it at this point. So we are saying that it's uh, pi squared over 2 if n is equal to 0, and then these other two cases that we'd already figured out. There we are. So now we can write our Fourier series, and what we're saying is that f of x is going to be equal to, well, that constant term we just talked about, plus, and then only the causes, and only the causes which have a, an, an um, odd, so cos 1, cos 3x, cos 5x, and so on, an odd multiplier of x, so we can do our trick if we like of saying let's go from n equals 0 to infinity, but write cos of uh, 2n plus 1x, and then we do need to divide by that, um, that integer squared. So that's the same trick we did before where we uh, just generate only the odd numbers by doubling it, adding 1. That's it. That's our Fourier series. That's our proposed answer to uh, the challenge of coming up with our triangular wave. And now uh, we can just zoom over to Mathematica to see if this works. So I'm just going to stare at this to memorize it. We have pi squared over 2. Oh, and I missed off, excuse me. Uh, we do have a factor of 4 that can come in front there that was from the fact that it was actually 4 over n squared. So I'm memorizing that. I'm going to come over to Mathematica. So are we doing that correctly? Yes, it's what we are asking for because we've got uh, cos uh, 3x over 9, cos 5 over 25, 7 over 49, and so on. This probably looks pretty familiar compared to the triangular wave we constructed last time. But nevertheless, let's see if we've actually got everything scaled correctly so it will work out. So we no longer need to see that. We'll put in a semicolon and we'll just write plot f for x, um, I don't know, minus... 7, 7, like we did before, and see what we get. And we'll need to, and there it is, it's certainly a triangular function. Let's um, scale it so it's a bit uh, less gigantic, and we can fit everything nicely on the screen. There we are now. So it looks persuasive. It's dropping down to 0 at pi and at minus pi. It looks good. It looks like the triangular wave we were seeking. But I think that's enough for this lecture, so thanks a lot for listening. And remember that if you would like to hear a, a slightly or see a slightly different explanation, then look in my notes. The examples I've uh, focused on here, I've tried to make them consistent with the notes so they just slot right in there, but the narrative around it will be expressed a little bit differently. Thanks for listening.